this almost comes to the end of uh, my three weeks journey in uh, India about uh, uh, presentations, about eight presentations in total so far. So this is the last of my presentation. Um, So, for uh, those of you still reeling from uh, last night's uh, effects of liquid, see, uh, I thought that this is quite relevant now, but who still got some lingering effect, feel free to so I'll give you a quick overview. And I don't know why the scientific committee chose me to present this talk. <laughs> but, I might be a bit, I might be a bit slow because of the lingering effects, but I'll try to be as pretty as possible. Now you might understand what is a cocktail. So a cocktail is a drink which has got three or more ingredients, but of which one of them is alcohol. Now you might wonder why I'm talking all these things because cocktails originated somewhere around the same time as local anesthetics also existed, and the reasons are many. But it became very popular in the U.S. prohibition time, where whiskey was difficult to obtain. It was expensive, it needs time to mature. So they found vodka and gin to be a better alternative, but to make it taste better, they added ingredients and it became a fashion. So the premise is the same, that people wanted something more and people start to make it as a fashion. So why do we need uh, cocktails in regional anesthesia? Yes, we all want quicker onset, increased duration and try to avoid catheters. And there's a new terminology called MMPNA. Esther, as you mentioned about MMA, which is multimodal analgesia, this is multimodal perineural analgesia, where there are so many different kinds of receptors in the body that you try to target many receptors so that you can reduce the uh, quantity of each individual drug or improve the quality of the block, increase the duration and also to reduce the systemic absorption of local anesthetic and reducing the dose so that toxic thresholds are not reached. So this is the summary. And why I've given it early is because those who've got the lingering effects from yesterday's content. So you can read this and go back to sleep. So I've given it into two categories, central neuraxia blocks and peripheral nerve blocks. Now these two are different entities and drugs that you can use in central neuraxia block does not necessarily mean you that you can use in peripheral nerve blocks. So opioids, epidural and fentanyl is commonly used and it is very well validated. In peripheral nerve blocks, so far it's only, with very few studies, it's only the buprenorphine which has been validated. Adrenaline, yes, in central neuraxial blocks, but with lignocaine only and molosal. And it's not recommended in peripheral nerve blocks. Chlorine, not recommended. I know how many of you use chlorine in central neuraxial blocks? Quite a few hands We will come to that later. Sorry to disappoint you guys. Now, ex meditomidin it's still a bit early to come to. More trials are awaited for both this. Dexamethasone, definitely not in central neuraxial blocks, but maybe in peripheral nerve blocks. Magnesium, yes, in central, but not yet in peripheral. That's not true, if you are presenting a meta analysis in the SR, so there are already trials. Peripheral nerve blocks. It's not very effective, it does. We'll come to that. All right, essentially, uh, we'll go through the pharmacological classes, and each of those classes we'll look into different types of blocks, and finally, I can talk about the PS block. Now, this is where the MMPNA comes from, that there are so many receptors in the body. You know, there are so many different groups of pain. And you know, one of the things where uh, the pain pathway, there is neuronal, non neuronal pathway. In the neuronal pathway, there is hundreds of receptors, which each of which contribute or modulate, it, either by ascending pathway modulation or descending pathway modulation. So we know that we can use many drugs. How we we'll know we know how clonidine works. We we'll know how adrenaline can work or opioids can work, and we'll go through that. So, how many of you prefer soda? <laughs> there is one hand. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. Not necessarily as a. I mean, just uh, continue with last night again.
increases the pH, increases the non-ionized component. It increases the non-ionized component, and it's very useful that it quickens the onset, reduces the pain of local anesthetic injection. But the main issue is if you use a volume more than 0.1 mL for 20 mL of local anesthetic, it can cause precipitation, and you have to use it at room temperature, and it's not suitable for infusions. Opioids. Now, been using opioids in the central neuroaxial blocks for a very, very long time. We all know people have thrown every kind of drugs into the spinal cord, you know, or near the spinal cord. We all know that there are different pathways for uh, opioid uh, pain and, or analgesia. We all know that mu delta kappa receptors, which is the ascending pathway. But there is also what are called supraspinal pathways and modulation of descending pathway also. When it comes to intrathecal injections, now, lipophilic opioids are better. They provide segmental analgesia. But when it comes to epidural injection, the hydrophilic opioids like morphine is better. The main reason is because uh, the, there is much greater systemic absorption of lipophilic opioids from uh, epidural space. So you won't get that distribution into the intrathecal space. Right? So there has been studies which have shown that when you've used infusions like uh, ropimucane with fentanyl, it is more often it acts through the supraspinal pathway than the segmental pathway. Alright? So I would suggest that if you want to use a longer acting agents through epidural, morphine might be a better choice. For peripheral nerve blocks, there is no conclusive evidence except for buprenorphine. Tramadol. Uh, it's a unique drug, you know, that it actually every year probably they will find some site of action for tramadol or some mechanism of action. So it's got some opioid activity, alpha-2, serotonergic pathways, inhibits the reuptake of noradrenaline and serotonin and it is also shown to have direct local anesthetic like effect. Central neuroaxial block, poor and variable results and there is some question of neuro neurotoxicity. Peripheral nerve blocks, there have been few studies, so the results have been 50-50. So around doses of 100 mg, it's only shown to prolong the blocks of short and intermediate acting agents, not with long acting agents. And again, the premise is that it increases the duration, but not beyond, because its effects are much shorter than the actual duration of the long acting agent. So there is no point in giving adjuvant like tramadol to a long acting agent already. Adrenaline is another very interesting drug, you know. The usual device is that it reduces the clearance of local anesthetic from the space where you have injected. So it reduces systemic toxicity. But it is also shown to have some alpha to agonistic activity. The other problem with adrenaline can be is, now when, it, when you inject local anesthetic with adrenaline into the epidural space, there is a epidural fat. Adrenaline is hydrophilic, so it doesn't enter as much into the fat tissue. So there is very small quantities of adrenaline that enters the epidural fat. And at low doses, adrenaline can cause vasodilatation. Agree? Most of you are aware of this? Yes. So what happens then there is more systemic absorption of local anesthetic and less spinal or uh, epidural effect. So it could be counterproductive there. But what is shown to be quicker onset, improved depth of analgesia, and prolonged duration. With peripheral nerve blocks, there is some uh, fear about in affecting the endoneuronal blood flow and causing neurotoxicity. And the current recommendation is not to use concentrations any less than 1 in 400,000. And there is no convincing evidence for peripheral nerve blocks. This is the drug everyone loves here, I believe. But these are the two drugs. How many of you use it? on a day-to-day -day practice. More than 80% here, I think. So, and most of you, I think 75% of them are currently using in uh, central neuroaxial blocks despite me saying it's not recommended. We'll look into why. So we know it acts on alpha-2 uh, post-junctional receptors and affecting, uh, you know, pathways of pain, both ascending and descending. It's also got multiple other actions. Affects C and A delta fibers. It, it increases the production conductance in the nerve fibers. It's got local vasoconstriction and local anesthetic-like activity. So, again, like tramadol, they're finding newer and new kind of tech, uh, how it's happening, mechanisms of action. Let's look into the evidence. Yes, with central neuroaxial block, it does provide intraoperative, good intraoperative analgesia, prolonged sensory and motor block, yes, 
but the maximum duration that they have found in prolongation is around 2 hours. And there is a great variation from 30 minutes to 2 hours, but the maximum is 2 hours. And compared to the intrathecal opioids, it does not produce respiratory depression, pro urinary retention and all those things. But a consistent problem across all studies is persistent hypertension, which is difficult to treat, and persistent bradycardia, which causes significant problems. Time and again, this has been raised up in our forum. How many of you agree that this is a problem? No. No. Not a problem? No. No. That persistent hypertension and bradycardia is not a problem in your head? We have been using less doses. Less doses. So, the dose, it is linearly dependent on the dose. Yes. Okay? But when people started to use that, 75. so they were doing anything more than 75 mics is going to cause a problem. So, from 75 mics. Let's stop it. It's as simple as that. Once you exceed 1 mic, you will not get it. As long as you have less than one month around to kill, it's fine. Again, the duration is also dependent on the dose. So it's kind of, you are in stuck between, if you want a 30 minute prolongation, why would you use something? No, you know, I fail to understand that. Anyway, with peripheral nerve blocks, there is prolonged duration of the block and analgesia, but it's solely been shown to be with short and intermediate acting local anesthetic. Again, the effect of turidine is much shorter than the duration of the long-acting local anesthetic. There is still some problems with hypertension and bradycardia, but not as much as a central neuraxial block. How many of you use magnesium or ketamine in their blocks, either peripheral or central neuraxial block? No one. There is good evidence. All right, especially magnesium. In the central neuraxial pathways, there, it, we all know it is through the NMDA and there is a it acts on many other receptors, cholinergic, serotonergic, and opioid receptors too. And it also regulates the calcium influx. It's only proven to be useful in central neuraxial blocks and magnesium. There is good evidence and meta analysis on that. About dose of 100 to 200 milligrams are shown to provide quicker onset, improved quality and duration of analgesia, and prolonged duration of sensory and motor block. A lot of literature on midazolam has come from India. That's what I know. And again, we are quite confident in throwing things into that, but it has shown to do well actually. Uh, so we know it's a GABA agonist and it's also got other effects on GABA and delta receptors. Intrathecal, epidural, intra-articular, PMP, midazolam has been used in all these places. Uh, make sure you use preservative free in small doses. Although there is limited data, so the total meta-analytic result for about 672 patients it showed some improved analgesia, but there was no prolongation of motor block, which is what we want, and associated with reduced fever. So maybe you can use that. Dexamethasone, the initial theory was that it probably acts by reducing local anesthetic absorption, but it is also shown to have activities on potassium channels and C fibers. Consistently shown to increase the duration of the block by one and a half to two times. And there's been some concerns about hyperglycemia, some neurotoxic potential, and recent studies have shown that the duration is not significantly different if you have used it IV compared to blocks. Non-steroidals have been used, and there's proposal of uh, inflammatory soup and many uh, inflammatory pro like prostaglandins and all those things being released in the periphery, so trying to counteract that effect. It's been used in uh, VS block and intraarticular injections. It's shown to decrease the onset times and improve the analgesia. But there are very limited studies. Neostigmine, how many of you are here? No. I think there are quite a few studies coming from India too, in, in fact. And uh, we know it acts well. There are different mechanisms of action. The onset is better, the duration for a motor block is better, but the problems is quite significant. So we had a good agent which could provide a proven quality of analgesia and improved duration, but the problems were so significant that it has to be stopped. Adenosine has also got some effects, but again there was no evidence for that. Finally, I'll talk about a little bit on uh, IVRS. These are the list of drugs that have got some evidence. Choose what you want and uh, but choose carefully and I won't go into how a BS block is being conducted. 
uh, opioids have got strong evidence, clonidine has got good evidence, magnesium has got good evidence, non-steroidals are very commonly used, there is uh, equivocal evidence regarding that, dexamethasone, again, not so great evidence at the moment, muscle relaxing, there are quite a few studies showing improved motor block and helping in uh, reduction of fractures. Now, mixing of local anesthetic, how many of you mix uh, short acting and long acting? The premise is that, okay, I'll finish off. The premise is that you get a quicker onset with a shorter acting and a longer duration from rope to cave. But the evidence is contradictory. There have been multiple trials on that. And the problem is, one of the problems is the concentration of each local anesthetic is diluted. Onset and duration becomes unpredictable. And the duration is actually shorter than if you have used the long acting agent alone. Alright? So, I don't find the reason why, and you can ask the surgeon. he waits for the block to act, you know, he makes sure that the blocks are, so if you give that extra minute, just using long acting alone is efficient. And one study found that the duration of the mix was equal to the duration of the shortest acting agent. So much is the unpredictable, and there is always risk of less toxicity. So I guess this is a take home message, think before you do. If you want a quick onset block, do a block with just short acting only and the surgeon can infiltrate a long acting agent to the skin or don't mix it at all, just use a long acting agent. Just a quick review of my practice, this is from my audit that I do through the app that I got talking about. So you can see the usage of my uh, adjuncts has changed. Earlier on, one in four of my blocks had adjuncts. Later on, it came down with some uh, emerging evidence of lack of efficacy and risk of toxicity and then it gone up again and wondering what kinds of drugs I used in my practice from uh, 2012 to 2016. Earlier I used clonidine, tramadol and dexamethasone but currently one in four of my patients get dexamethasone. So in summary, this is my advice. How many of you have been? Thank you.